Buen dia. You all look great today. And uh, I have a question for you all. Think uh, about your job in the next few years, five, ten years. Are you afraid your job becomes irrelevant because AI is taking over? Um, are you afraid that uh, your profession is going to become even extinct? Well, what if I tell you that artificial intelligence professors like myself, some of them at least, feel this way as well? Isn't that weird? Well, today I will be talking about, I will be sharing some thoughts about uh, how AI academics like myself can stay relevant and make an impact to this world. Well, some of us might think that, um, you know, this is the end of academia. Or some of us might think that this is the great opportunity that AI takes over and actually makes a positive impact in the world. So, I'm Yorgos Yanakakis, an AI academic and entrepreneur uh, based in the tiny yet beautiful island of Malta. This is a corridor of my university that you see over there. And uh, as I said, I will be sharing some thoughts on how academics like ourselves, universities actually as a whole, can stay relevant and make an impact to this world. So, I would, argue, I would argue today with you that uh, academic AI long lives and can make a very positive impact to our world. So where's the problem? What is the problem I'm talking about? Well, you know, 10 years ago, if you had a machine like that, a very decent machine, and a stable internet connection, then you had everything you needed to compete with the very best out there. But that's not the case anymore. So where's the problem? The problem is called, or the challenge, is called scaling maximalism. What does this mean? Well, it means that if you scale, you do better. If your AI models are better, then they can do smarter and more powerful things. But the larger the model you have out there, the more compute it requires and the more data it requires to be trained. But you know what? Only a few have this capacity in this world today to actually train those large models. And um, I would even argue that, unfortunately, AI innovation has left the university a long time ago because very few AI departments, universities, and even countries as a whole can actually support this massive scale. If you think of Malta, for instance, the gross domestic product of Malta is about 20 million, right? So we are looking, when, when, when we are looking at ChatGPT and, the, G, and the, the, the big models of, uh, the large language models of the GPT family, we're looking at trillions of parameters and thousands and thousands of dollars invested to actually uh, train those models. So my friend Carl here would say, I warned you this would happen. So let's see what scale in maximalism actually does. Well, scaling maximalism tends to follow most technological progress out there. And uh, I'll give you an example uh, of technological progress over time, picking um, airplanes as my example. So initially we didn't have planes, but eventually we got a very, well, we got a plane uh, with bike parts and wooden parts. And then uh, eventually we got the St. Uh, Louis Spirit, a good plane. Uh, by the 70s, we got an amazing plane, jet, Boeing, let's pick uh, 747 as an example. 50 years after, we have very good planes that they are variants of this plane, right? So they are cheap, they are cheaper maybe, more efficient and so on. But we never really saw um, nuclear-powered space airplanes, not, not yet at least. We never really saw bike planes that commercialize the Wright Brothers plane. Right? So the question is, where does AI stand nowadays when it comes to this technological curve, technological progress curve? Well, some colleagues of mine would say we stand somewhere there. Right? So we're really close to converge to awesome AI systems with some sort of that require only a few tricks here and there to become even better. Right? This is where we need to put more scale and more dollars, euros, whatever, to make GPT even better. But some colleagues of mine would say, we're really, really far away from that. In addition to scale, we need to innovate our algorithms. We need a new family, a new generation of algorithms to be invented. So, you know what, independently of where we are, because it's really hard to predict the future, um, we need scale. So, what do you do? 
Did you start a revolution? Do you stop technological progress? It makes absolutely no sense. So what I did with a friend of mine is instead to write a paper about it as a stance of academics in the current AI arms race uh, with this flamboyant title that you see over there. So you know what? Many people read it, many people liked it, many people disagreed with it, but most importantly, People from the European Commission, the Alan Turing Institute, and so on read it, and they invited us over to talk about it. So we actually made an impact. And um, this paper lists a number of strategies that I want us to go through with you today. And uh, through these selected strategies of how you know, young, young researchers in artificial intelligence can stay relevant and impactful, I will also give my own personal journey. So the first strategy is, Quit. Not quit your job, but quit doing things that are really impactful. All right? And uh, obviously, you can do that if you're a professor. Why not? But uh, honestly, let's admit it. Um, quitting is not uh, aligned very well with academic values. So actually, you choose to become a researcher because you want to make an impact. So screw that one. I will never, <laughs> we should never sort of stop doing uh, the things that we love, right? I will never give up my profession or giving up trying to stay impactful. Strategy number two is the other end of the spectrum. You try to scale anyhow. You try to compete with, with the best out there. You try to compete with OpenAI, right? So what do you do? You are very ambitious. You, you bring all the money in the world. You attract the best grants from European Commission, uh, millions of, of euros, and then you're, you're happy, and you go on and you try on uh, replicating something like this. Learning to play Minecraft with video pre-training, for instance, like an OpenAI paper or NVIDIA papers, right? So you want to replicate these experiments. You soon realize you have one experiment to run, because that's the budget you have. And you also realize that the team you have, full of researchers, talented minds, and so on, cannot really scale. They don't know how to do this, right? So maybe if you want to try to scale anyhow, on your own is not a very wise strategy. So let's look at the next one. This is a very popular one that I call reuse and remaster. So what do you, what do, you do here? You go out and find models that other people have trained. Let's say Microsoft, Meta, and so on. And you repurpose them, you retrain them to your own, own, own problem. So we have been doing that in my lab in several different ways. We have been using meta models or uh, Microsoft models to fine tune into our problems. And our problems are as follows. How can an agent play a game in a general fashion? How can I basically train an agent to play Counter-Strike? I don't know how many of you have played this game. It's a very well-known game. And be able to play unseen games in the first-person shooter genre, or even you know games like Minecraft. How can I make baby steps towards what is called artificial general intelligence within games. So I think we have been quite successful in doing that in the lab. Now, next strategy, solve problems if you care about. This is a favorite one because, you know, just because of my personality. So you just go around and you ask people, what do you do these days? What is your problem? X, Y, Z. And then you end up not doing that. You just do something completely different, right? Uh, well, this is a strategy of high risk because you might fail. But if you truly believe in your ideas, you might excel. So let me show you an example of such a problem that I sort of figured out 20 years ago when I started my PhD. The problem is, how, uh, how can AI design fun video games for all, right? And what you see here in the video is an AI agent playing Super Mario and another AI agent designing the level for this AI player, right? So that the game becomes maximally fun. Now, this is awesome that we can do it these days through reinforcement learning. It's generative AI through reinforcement learning. But uh, you might ask yourselves, why is this relevant to AI, and how will that impact the world? Well, as a matter of fact, game design problems like this one are used nowadays thoroughly in the AI community, essentially changing the way AI designs its own worlds and improves through the design, the continuous design of its own world. Um, so who, 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 who would have thought that 20 years after, um, there would be an entire community dedicated on the study of AI in games, there would be prestigious journals, and here's me like four years ago, 
talking about the core evolution of artificial intelligence in games in Congress of Futuro, right? So, right, as a very, very stupid problem, 20 years ago, um, when everyone was working with robotics, you know, um, nowadays becomes a very relevant problem. So, yes, try out this strategy if you truly believe in your ideas. Another, another very popular strategy, uh, I call it uh, start a startup. So take the entrepreneur entrepreneurship path. And um, you might want to do that because you truly believe that once you start up a company, you will have access to more data and more compute, and you will actually work with real world problems, which is great. Now, we did that um, six years ago. Uh, with a friend, a number of friends of mine, we start up Model AI a company using AI to automatically test games. So you can think of yourselves as game designers, design something, you submit it to us, and our AI engine is going to tell you where the bugs of these games are, where the glitches are, and so on. Now, this path has been quite, uh, this journey has been quite fulfilling, both academically and uh, innovation-wise, because we managed to actually publish a number of papers through this, and uh, get to work with people, uh, with clients, very, very famous clients and video game developers, to the degree that Microsoft uh, invested in this company. So we're really, really happy. But you know what? This path is not for everyone because it's very stressful. So you might not want to do that. You might want in instead to collaborate with the industry. How do you do that? Well, you take your PhD students over there for a bit, you go yourself for a bit, or you stay there if you like it. And um, actually, some of the best advancements in AI research that have been shown in this conference and elsewhere are relying on this sort of collaboration between academia and industry. So it is a really viable and very, very good strategy to follow. Now, everyone benefits from this as long as everyone actually sees it this way. And um, well, let me, let me show you an example of what we have been doing in my lab in, in, in association to this strategy. Um, what you see here is a number of screenshots of our collaboration, long-standing collaboration with Ubisoft. If you play games, you might have heard of Ubisoft, right? It's a very well-known studio. Uh, with Ubisoft, we have been trying to analyze player experience from both a positive end, let's say engagement, player engagement, and a negative end, player toxicity, how basically you know, players bully each other over uh, multiplayer games. And uh, again, this collaboration has been really, really fulfilling because we got Ubisoft's expertise in game design and we got data, and Ubisoft got all the expertise that we have to offer on player modeling and machine learning and AI. Right, so... I will end this presentation with the following question. How can we all help? How can you, me, everybody help here so that the university still remains relevant and makes a positive impact in the AI arms race? How does the university stay relevant so that we keep ending having uh, you know, ethically compliant, trustworthy AI that makes our world a better place? Well. A lot of th stuff has been happening, especially in the European Commission with the AI Act. Uh, but when it comes to our industry players and our industry friends, um, my suggestion and our suggestion with Julian is to follow the open source trend because they can only, industry can only benefit from collaborating with academia. And obviously, academia can benefit too. And as I said before, the very best of the papers are actually relying on this collaboration. So the more we follow the open source movement, the more we open our sources, our source code, sorry, and our papers, the better for everyone. When it comes to universities and public, public bodies, policy makers, well, we need to actually invest more and promote high gain, high impact uh, research, more basic forms of artificial intelligence research. Otherwise, the university will eventually become redundant. So, I would like to end this talk with an analogy from the world of art, uh, from one of my favorite painters. Uh, I feel that René Magritte, reflecting on his Empire of Light painting series, would agree with me today that as much darkness there is in the world of academic AI, the light of opportunity is out there and is calling us to shine. Thank you so much for your attention.